Hello everyone and welcome to task number four. In this task, we are going to cover key AI terminologies or lingo and we're going to explore what is actually going on under the hood as well. If you guys remember, in the previous task, we learned about the difference between model training and testing. We covered the process of training an AI model and we also covered the process of testing here. If you guys remember, after we freeze the weights, and we test the performance of the model on a new data set that the model has never seen before during that phase, which is a training phase. Okay, so today's task is gonna be in the intermediate level. So um, I'll try to make it as easy as possible. So let's go ahead and cover the first definition. So the first definition is known as epochs. And if you guys recall, if you click on under the hood, you will see that we have a parameter known as epoch and it's by default set to 50. Basically, AI similar to humans learn through experience, learn through multiple iterations. We as humans, we don't learn in one shot. We learn over time and that's why we call it practice makes perfect. So similar to humans, AI learns over time and its intelligence kind of amplifies as we continually or continuously feed the training data to it. So the question is, what is an epoch? An epoch means that AI has been fed with the entire data set just once. So let's say uh, if we are training an AI model from scratch, most of the time, because we are exposing that data to the AI model for the first time, most of the time we start with a very large error initially. And then over time we get better. Over time we start to kind of learn from our past uh, expertise and then we, we get better over time. And that's why in general over time at Epoch 1, you will find that the um, mean squared error, for example, as a metric tend to go down. And then in Epoch 2, the errors tend to go down as well. Epoch 3 goes down as well. And over time, you will find that the mean squared error keep going down and down and down until we actually stop. And that means the model right now has been trained and is good to be deployed in the field and to actually be um, exposed to a new data set that it has never seen before during the training phase. Okay. So let's go ahead and cover the definition here by uh, Google Teachable Machines. So one epoch means that each and every sample in the training data set has been fed through the training model at least once. So for example, in our case, let's say in the fashion class we had uh, in the original um, data set, we had 10 classes and we had 100 images per class, meaning in total I had 1000 images. So if I feed in the thousand images, the entire data set, and I update the weights of the AI model once, that's a good thing. That means now this is an epoch. So if you feed the entire data set once, that's an epoch. So for example, if I have, let's say 50 epochs, that means the model will be exposed to the same data set 50 times. It's like, you know, like, like getting the AI model and feeding in the data. Please learn that data, learn that data, learn that data. And we're doing it like over and over again. And that's why it gets better over time. And we do it here. Let's say if we set the epoch to 50, that means we're going to repeat that 50 times. And most of the time, if we increase the number of epochs, you will find that you come up with better predictions over time. But at some point beyond, let's say, a certain number, of course, depending on the complexity of the data, depending on the architecture of the model, you might need not to go, you know, to train it for, let's say, 2000 epochs. And that's why there's a lot of, uh, I would say, human judgment that has to come into play to get an idea of what would be the best number. Google Teachable Machine set the default value to 50 here. OK. All right. So that covers the first definition. The second definition is known as the batch size. So when AI is trained, we generally don't feed the entire data set to the model in just one shot. And the reason behind it is we might have computation limitation. We might have memory limitation. And that's why, let's say if we have, for example, 1000 images, we don't feed the entire 1000 images at once. We break them down into groups or batches. And that's what we're doing here. 
So we generally break down the entire data into smaller batches, which are fed to the model individually. And essentially an epoch, one epoch contains one or more batches. So if you zoom in here, a batch is a set of samples used in one iteration of training. So for example, if let's assume that I have, let's say 80 images, for example, and if you choose the batch size to be equals to 16, that means I'm gonna take the entire 80 images and I'm going to divide by the batch size, which is 16, I will end up with five batches, meaning I'm going to feed in the data to the model in batches and then we're gonna have five of those. Once all five batches have been fed through the, through the model, exactly one epoch will be complete. Okay, all right. So that simply concludes the second definition. The third definition, which is one of the most important one, is known as the learning rate. And learning rate simply represent the size of the steps taken, which indicates how aggressive you would like to train the AI model. And think of it this way. Let's assume that you are a teacher and you have, let's say, a little, for example, kid, and you're teaching that kid, for example, how to walk. Well, you have two strategies, either to teach that kid slowly, okay? When I say slowly, that means you are setting the learning rate to be very, very small. Or you can just go crazy. You can just set the learning rate to be very, very high and kind of push the boundaries for that kid to actually learn how to walk in a much, much faster way. And that's the, pretty much the same idea here. If I increase the learning rate, that means I become really aggressive, meaning I'm gonna be training the AI model at a much faster rate. I'm gonna be updating the weights a lot more aggressively. And if I set the learning rate to be very, very small, then I'm, it's like, you know, I'm taking it easy. I'm gonna take my time to train the AI model. And that's why, if you set the learning rate to be very small value, then it will take much, much longer time for the AI model to converge. However, if you set the learning rate to be so high, you again, you're gonna go crazy, right? So you're gonna be forcing the AI model to converge what, a lot quicker. And the problem is you might reach what we call it, you'll be essentially um, overshooting the point that you're looking for. So for example, what we call a global minimum point, I'm not gonna be able to reach it. I'm gonna be like shattering across that global minimum. And that's why adjusting the learning rate is an art on its own. And you need to come up with the optimal point, not too small, not too hard, not too large. And that's the overall idea in here, okay? So if the learning rate increases, the area covered in the search space will increase so we might reach the goal, which is our global minimum much, much faster. However, we can overshoot the target. So if you guys see here, this is essentially the, what we call it the error surface. And most of the time, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to find the point that minimizes the error. Like I need to get the minimum error. If you guys remember when we compare the predictions from the network to the ground truth, to the actual training data, and we calculate the error signal. All what we're looking for is that we're looking for the point where we minimize the error as much as we can. We wanna find the minimum error. And that's the overall idea here as well. So if we grab the error surface, this is essentially the point that I'm looking for. That's what I want. And that's why if you increase the learning rate, that means you'll be moving here a lot faster. So you might achieve that point that you're looking for faster. But the only problem is that you will overshoot that target. However, if you set this, the learning rate to be very small, then training will take a much longer time for it to reach that point, but you are not gonna be overshooting that target. Okay, all right. So that simply concludes our learning rate. And then the last definition that I wanted to cover uh, for you guys is accuracy and loss. So if you actually click on under the hood, you guys will see that here on the right hand side, you will see graphs and these graphs indicates the actual progress of our data, of our training over the number of epochs. So for example, here I have the accuracy. So initially the accuracy wasn't too high, it was like 0.8 and then over time it starts to become better and better. Now it becomes like 0.9, you know, and so on until it reaches almost 100%. Same deal as well for the loss. When you when I say loss, think of it as more of an error. 
So the error starts very high initially, and then over time, you guys will see that the error tends to go down. And please note that here I have essentially two types of accuracies and two types of losses too. One for the training set and one for the testing set. And what you guys see here is on the accuracy on the training data tend to be way better compared to the testing data, which makes sense because in general, the testing data has never been seen by the model during training. And same deal as well for the loss. You guys will see that the loss or the error on the training data, which is my blue line here, tend to be less compared or smaller compared to the test loss or the error on the, um, on the testing data set. Okay, all right. So that's it. That's simply all I have for task number four. I hope you guys enjoyed it. In task number five, let's go ahead and cover a very important um, definition, which is known as confusion matrix. Please stay tuned. Best of luck. And I'll see you guys in the next task.